Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our online program at Mechanics Institute for Constructing a Nervous System, a memoir by author Margot Jefferson. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute, and we are very proud to co-sponsor this event with City Lights Books and Publishing. And I want to also welcome my colleague and friend, Peter Maravellis, Program Manager at City Lights. And both Peter and I will be co-interlocutors for this event. If you're new to the Mechanics Institute, and I see a lot of new faces out there, uh, we were founded in 1854 and were one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. Please visit our website at milibrary.org and also come on down and see us in person um, at 57 Post Street because we are open. Constructing a Nervous System is available through City Lights Books and Publishing, and we put the link in the chat. So if you'd like to actually purchase a book directly, go and copy the link and purchase a book. And for the 20 attendees receiving a book, you, will, uh, you must be present on Zoom, and your book will be sent to you by mail by City Lights. Ooh, nice. Constructing a Nervous System, a memoir, it's an exploration of self through family, characters of literature, performers, muses, and obsessions that have shaped Margot Jefferson's inner life and her way of thinking and being. One critic said that her work and her writing is, is balletic, and I agree. Her writing soars and dives and dips with such grace and with such power. And we are just delighted to present her for the first time and also this incredible memoir. The winner of a Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, Margo Jefferson, previously served as book and art, arts critic for Newsweek and the New York Times. And her writing has appeared in among other publications, Vogue, New York Magazine, The Nation, and Guernica. And her memoir, Negro Land, received the National Book Circles Critics Circle Award for autobiography. She is also the author of On Michael Jackson and is a professor of writing at Columbia University School of the Arts. And my friend and colleague, Peter Maravellas, is a native San Franciscan with a lifelong involvement in the art and literary scenes, to say the least. He his, his programs the events calendar at City Lights Books Bookstore and is an editor of the first and second volumes of San Francisco Noir and also the producer of the most amazing literary festivals, which we have collaborated on many. So please welcome Margo Jefferson and my colleague, Peter Maravellis. So Margo, I'm gonna jump in with the first question. You know, with your work uh, with, uh, for so long as both a critic, a journalist, a writer, uh, with this book, you, you stated that you wanted memoir and criticism to merge together. So what was your motivation and, and how did this evolve? Well, I, I wanted them in conversation. I had spent all of these years as as, as a critic, as a reviewer, as an essayist. And then I, the Michael Jackson book in some ways to me seemed transitional in that he was such a complicated, problematic figure that there was no way I could approach him with a kind of even critical authority, you know, with, with that, ah, here it is, here's, I knew there'd be ambivalences, uncertainties, um, mixed feelings, and that I would have to explore those, and that I'd have to get, uh, in some ways, you know, bring my own um, life to the ways in which, my own emotions, and as well as thoughts, um, to the ways in which he 
he moved me and also seemed to move um, uh, a global, you know, <laughs> move the globe, shall we say. So I felt that was in a way a, um, a transition to what I knew then would be um, a memoir, Negro Land. I'd, I'd been thinking about that for a long time because that world, you know, um, that had shaped me was that generation, my parents' generation was, they were fading, they were dying. Um, and I knew that I wanted that to be what I called in my mind, a cultural memoir, meaning, you know, the, the so-called intimate, you know, private personal self is always um, moving in and out of um, this much larger culture that Yay. requires it to perform um, in a number of ways, you know, to play various roles. There isn't just one solitary, you know, lyric or fighting, struggling, you know, <laughs> pilgrimage self. There are many of them. Um, and you are as marked by the larger culture and by history um, as by psychology, you know, <laughs> aesthetics, etc., and family. Um, so there was that. And um, then people kept saying, well, you know, you're going to write another memoir, volume two. And I kept thinking, mm, no, I don't, don't want a kind of um, step by step by step. Here is volume two. Um, so I, I, had, I was interested in, I think I posed this in Negroland, how do you tell what seems to be the same story in a number of different ways? How do you do that? And Thinking over that, um, I re realized, or you know, often you you know things first, and but it takes them a while to surface. Um, I thought, all right, um, every every encounter, um, or not every, but many encounters one's had with everything from you know some little piece of ephemera, you know, um, to some major piece of art, to the line of a song, to um, the view outside your window, to a postcard that you buy, um, you know, after you leave, after you leave a museum. Um, all of those, um, they're part of your personal culture, and that means they're part of your psyche, um, and they are all as, you are as intimate with them. They're just as revealing, they're just as telling, as um, the parents you grew up with, you know, the city you're part of, all these, these identities that we name as geographic, class, religious, um, you know, sexual, gender, we take their importance for granted, um, but we don't always um, fully take account of um, these other intimations and, you know, and interventions and these things that stir the most vehement feelings in you and that you've always possessed, you know, on your own and by yourself. So that's, I wanted to merge, find, not so much merge, but have a conversations constantly being generated between those kinds of, um, of memories, of experiences, um, of, of lives, really. Great, thanks. Peter, do you want to continue? Thank you, Laura. And it's great to be back to Mechanics Institute again and wonderful to be working with you and Pam. And, and really, Ms. Jefferson, a great honor to be here tonight and such a wonderful package on top of everything else. That cover is stunning. I just absolutely oh, love it. Bless their um, hearts. They, they, they worked so hard on that. We kept going over it. I'm glad. Okay. <laughs> so firstly, I'd like to congratulate you really on creating a wonderfully kaleidoscopic and very immersive narrative experience. I, I just are, a delight. Those are, two, those are two great words. Thank you. Yes. So, Really enjoyed it. Uh, so my thoughts gravitate towards how you redefine a nervous system. I mean, not as something physical or biological, but but you, you, as you describe, you know, in a quote, I, my structure of recombinant thoughts, memories, sensations, and words, unquote. Would you address how you came to this theme, how the fragments came together to make the whole, how the elements of memory shaped the writing? I mean, what was the interplay between them like? Whoa, um, well, <laughs> Peter, that's a big question. Um, the interplay, I, by, um, I have always, even with what appears to be a 
straightforward review. I've always worked in a kind of magpie way. Um, you know, I'll make, take, start taking random notes, associations with, let's say, this particular book or this play. Then I'll decide, well, let me know. I, this, this makes me think of this piece of music. So I'll do that. Um, then I'll go off on uh, the research, um, either the direction or the tangent um, that I need. Um, then I will start combining and recombining um, those elements and continue. And then that will tell me not only what it'll tell me what I'm missing, what I need to know in a very practical way, um, it might just even be a day, but it will also tell me what I really am interested in, what really is driving me. Um, and when you're reviewing, you know, you, you don't bond equally to everything you see. So it can be a real, real effort, you know, or a long and winding road to find your way to your particular um, pull, you know, to your, your link with it. So that is a way I, I have always worked. And, and that, it helped me here because it, it made me trust okay, you know, you are, here's Willa Cather, you're obsessed with her, here's, um, ooh, here I can Tina Turner. <laughs> How do you work with them? Um, you know, some of them I, I knew I'd loved. Um, uh, you know, I had no idea, for example, that um, Ella Fitzgerald would come out of Bud Powell, you know, and sweat, <laughs> but, <laughs> But it did, you know, you, you start associating and then you follow it through. You think, okay, maybe, maybe this won't work. Maybe it will, but it's, it's driving me and it's pulling me forward. So I'll go with it. Um, that Ella Fitzgerald Bud Powell section started, those that started out as two very short pieces, though they were clearly linked. Um, and then um, I had not written about my father at all in, well, I'd written about him, but in a formal distant way in Negro land, Bud Powell um, helped me dig into my father and his deep relationship with jazz, but also, you know, the, um, his melancholia, um, his certain kinds of isolation. Then, then I found my way to, um, to Ella Fitzgerald, partly because I realized you know, I, was, I was in that mode where you're thinking, well, when you're a child, um, what music stirs you, uh, what unnerves you, which Bob, Bud Powell did in some ways, and what restores you, what comforts you? And then that led me to Ella. So, you know, often what you're writing about will make you start asking questions that will lead you to, um, to a linked subject that you really didn't know was there. Um, the ways in which my magpie, um, magpieing was um, tricky was I kept accumulating material and then um, I, I would thinking, but, but wait, you know, then I would um, think, okay, I'm, this week, uh, all I'm gonna do is try to, is, is organize it, is find a structure. And then I wouldn't find the right one, what felt like the right one. Um, you know, I wouldn't find the, the momentum. I wouldn't find the links. I, and it would be too, too obscure. Um, and I get very, very, very discouraged. Um, so <laughs> a little bit like Penelope, you know, and the, you, undo, <laughs> you undo that weaving every night and then you start making it again. Um, but the more material I got, um, the more, and the clearer it was that I was, that, you know, con that memoir and, varieties of memoir, varieties of memories, varieties of being personal, and um, criticism, the, the ways in which, I wish I had a, a more intimate word for criticism, um, um, but the ways in which that um, altered the personal, um, but then took on its own intimacies. That, that I could trust, so that helped me um, keep going, but you really just keep restructuring and restructuring and restructuring. Yeah. Um, that was what was hardest, I would say. Yeah. I mean, it's, jump it's in really, real, sorry. Uh, Peter, I just want to jump in to ask two things along these lines. Are you a diarist? Do you keep diaries? And also, because that's another element, not just from criticism and observing and observance, but and also you have some really amazing pairing where you start pairing people together, comparing 
pairing and comparing like Sammy Davis Jr. with <laughs> and James Baldwin. Baldwin and this one, that one, and Willa Cather and someone else. And, and these interesting comparisons and contrasts and intermingling. So I don't know if you could address that. How did, yes, how did, how did, well, part of this was just, you know, coming from what I was just describing and a series of associations, but it was also um, willed um, in a certain way. I, growing up when and where I did, um, I, for example, let's just take literature. I grew up with the traditional literary canon, um, which was largely white, largely male. By the time I came along, it was as American as it had, uh, as it was European, but had those limits. Then there was a kind of progressive, because I went to progressive um, elementary and high schools. There was a kind of progressive layer on, <laughs> on top of that. Then um, when I went to college, 64 to 68, um, this was when, um, Black studies and ethnic studies um, emerged and these alternate canons and ways of being and ways of reading and each one um, shakes up you know, and makes you realign, we recombine these elements of, of your education, of your sensibility. Um, then, all right, we are just out of the 60s and there is the women's movement. And right on the heels of that, there are queer rights. And, and every part of this is, you know, um, pushing at and reshaping and, and your, your sensibilities and, and what you think of as, um, you know, as, as world orders. Uh, and of course, it, well, let me, let me go back. Let me, let me, let me not um, run past myself. Um, so all I, I needed to find, um, but I needed to, find and to be forthright about engaging with um, this disparate, you know, variegated, um, hybrid, um, impure in every way, um, mix of things that I loved and hated that, you know, across, through, through and across race and gender and, and chronology um, mattered to me desperately. And um, I didn't want to, you know, feel like, oh, I'm just a little dilettante for these. And I didn't want, you know, I did this, I did that. I was cared about this, I cared about that. And I didn't want those old, those more conventional conflicts. I mean, of course there are conflicts, for example, in the Willa Cather, but I, I didn't want, I want, wanted a structure, emotional and intellectual um, and literal, formal, that was much more, more complicated and promising, more, more vigorous, more surprising than, Oh, all right, that, that was black, that was white, they're clashing, that was male, that was female, they're, you know, whoop, they're, they're contending. I wanted multiple relationships between all these parts um, of my inner and outer world. That's one way in which being older is, is very interesting and very useful, my God. You know, you think, I, I actually made my little way through <laughs> all of those um, movements and eruptions and disruptions. And that's, that's fascinating. What do, what do I do with it? That's rich material. Back to you, Peter. Sure. So th though your influences are theatrical, musical, literary, I mean, what I find really just touches me is the role of your family. Mm. Uh, the members like your sister, your mother, your grandmother, I mean, they act as a kind of a chorus mm. really throughout all of this. And uh, would yes, you tell us a little bit about the role they play and, 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 and you know, the influence? Well, of course, that's, that's very, tell me a little more before I do that. Um, you, you're thinking of like the chorus in an ancient play where- Exactly, they, thank you. <laughs> where they are- um, taking in everything that's going on, but it turns out they're also a kind of, um, they're, they're like the, the golden mean almost. They sure, understand yeah. all sides and they're, yeah, okay. Okay, well, um, they, they were, they absolutely shaped me almost every moment of, and my sister, every moment of the day. This, this world um, of, um, of the black bourgeoisie was so um, 
in many ways, um, run, running along a gamut from, um, from very good to very not good, um, to, to, yeah, too bad. Um, they were wi wildly conscious of their historical place and their meaning. Um, and every one of us, every one of their children, um, they saw in, in a sense as symbols of where the race was going, where if you were a young black woman, where the sex was going, um, you know, you had, you weren't simply an individual, you were part of um, this progression um, of what was supposed to be always progress forward of black destiny. Um, and that meant that, um, you know, on every front, um, educational, political, cultural, um, they, they were making sure that we were educated. Um, as I was indicating in ways that were wonderful. Um, I mean, they're, both of them, their deep engagement with all kinds of music, dance, art. Um, in other ways, um, I'm speaking of the, the hierarchies and snobberies. Um, you know, that, that was very tricky. That was <laughs> a kind of um, manipulation that um, I would prefer not to have. Um, you were being um, scrutinized. Um, you, we were, I was also, we were both um, deeply loved, but that love um, was accompanied by real demands and expectations for um, a kind of perfection, I would say. Um, they were fascinating to me, people. They were charming. Oh, they were, um, yeah, complicated. Um, so aesthetically, they pleased me very much, as did my grandmother, as did in many ways that whole world. They could be very stylish and, um, you know, that, that sense of drama that came from their having achieved certain things that society in no way wanted them to have achieved or expected them to, you know, that, that, that was major. That was, you know, in, in that way, I see why you pick their chorus, you know, in, a, in an old play from any, um, an ancient play from any civilization the stakes are very high. It's life, death, it's survival. And it rather felt like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, living, you know, yes. And there were, of course, the ghosts of their ancestors um, who, would be, who would be cited. But um, also just a, a, a cute sensory and, and intellectual and temperamental engagement at all times. Um, you didn't always have the privacy you wanted. And then maybe another reason that this, this my obsession with these, these items, these, these mementos of a personal culture, you know, this, the voice of a singer, the, um, you know, the gesture of an, of an actor, and also turning my parents in some way, which I think you're addressing, and my grandmother and my sister, into these kind of large, you know, major characters major figures with which you have to engage dramatically. Well, speaking, speaking of character and, and dramatic entrances, um, you know, you have many you know, heroes and muses and you've devoted in terms of having a real heroine here, 20 plus pages to Josephine Baker. And as an icon, as a diva provocateur, as a jester and, you know, shaper of identity, women's identity and black identity and, and know, sexual identity, and sexual yeah. identity. I'd love you to talk more about what, in, what was, what inspired you about her personally. Um, and also I want to mention for those of you in the audience, that uh, Margo was also one of the narrators of that incredible PBS series on Josephine Baker, which was shown on KQED. If you haven't seen it, please go back to the KQED website and try to find it. It's really phenomenal. And um, Margo, your contribution was, was wonderful. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, actually, um, Josephine Baker was first presented to me um, by my mother who loved show business and it was presented, she was presented as this glamorous questing, you know, Euro, Euro, European based, but from our own, you know, um, black America uh, figure who 
I don't know if mother actually put it that way, but who embodied risks you could take um, and talents that you could choose to, to develop and to foreground and to be um, almost shameless about. <laughs> mother wouldn't have used the word shameless till later in her life when she got naughty, but you know, you don't love Josephine Baker if you don't love a certain shamelessness. So, you know, she was fascinating to me. I was, you know, always trying to, you know, project myself into this glamorous figure, or that glamorous figure as, you know, as young people did, but oh God, young girls in the fifties, we were, we were obsessed with finding these, you know, these mirrors, these glamorous mirror images that elevated us. Um, so there was Josephine and she's been with me really since, since in that way, she was first presented to me in, in, um, in high school. What then happened was in the seventies, um, again, it was, it was the women's movement and it was the aesthetic wing, a whole number of black women, white women also, but for our purposes, we're talking black women, singers and performers were being their records, like Bessie Smith from Ma Rainey, their records had been out of print for years. They were being reissued. Um, they were being you know, written about. Um, the whole history of, um, in terms of gender of, popular song and, and the blues was being altered so that, and being reinvestigated so that, you know, women were not you know, on the lower rung of popularizers, you know, who, who weren't really thinking and, and working and feeling their way, you know, through innovations. Josephine Baker, that's in the set early seventies was when a, an LP of her singing both in French, French songs and some Fats Waller numbers um, that came out and I bought it and I was so charmed by her voice and by these persona, you know, she would sound both French, but Harlem when she sang Fats Waller and she would sound, it seemed entirely French, but maybe also Harlem when she sang J'ai deux amours. Uh, you know, so she entered my, my gallery of fascinating performers. Uh, then I got to know, um, well, actually it came, it was after, when Jean-Claude Baker, who was one of her adopted sons and who ran a restaurant in New York called Chez Josephine, um, when he wrote a biography of her, and by that time I was at, at the time, so it would have been in the 90s, that gave me, you know, all of this, everything I needed to know, this, the complications, the, the social complications, the historical complications, this, this, warrior of a personality, um, you know, a seducer, a warrior, really in that way, like, you know, the old pantheons um, of, of goddesses, you know, I will, I will slay, you know, I will seduce, I will master. Um, the, the, um, the canny recklessness um, just fascinated me. It, not, she, nothing held her back. Now, if black people didn't like her wearing bananas, which sometimes they didn't, she still did. If white people in, insulted and patronized her for it, even while you know patting her on the head, she kept going. Um, but not that struggling of keeping going. She she would just keep like a great musician who improvises. That's what she could do with her dancing, her singing, and her her presence in the world. Um, and that, to me, that kind of joie de vivre as combined with technique, you know, um, with art, um, with you know, the mother part, for example, the adopting of all the children, some of whom she all but stole from their parents, um, that interests me less than, frankly, her performance, but the fact that she kept finding some new identity for herself um, and that that was one of the identities and that it in some way did have to do, it did not make her a good mother, but it did have to do with some kind of global vision. <laughs> um, how can you resist that? Um, you know, I saw her on stage when she was in, she had to be in her seventies or eighties and she came out in one of those, you know, form-fitting costumes and she was enchanting. There was nothing pathetic. There was nothing ridiculous. 
how do you, you know, how do you master yourself, um, everybody else's expectations and the world? And, you know, on top of that, she was undercover in World War II, <laughs> fighting against the Nazis. And right. she wore the uniform of the Free French Army and um, to the March on Washington, you know, which <laughs> is quite a, a wonderful gesture. Yeah. Wasn't she the only other speaker other than Martin yeah. Luther King? She was, she was the only woman. Woman. And she oh, had yeah. the, she was wearing, a, was it the French uniform? French, the uniform of the Free French. Yeah. yeah. Free yeah. French. And, and those big, big, big sunglasses that yeah. women of a certain age always wore, you know, which became a badge of honor. Yeah. But she really, she came home. I mean, she... She really had that. She she was brave, and she came home for the issues and the the politics that she really wanted to to speak Absolutely. to and fight for. In so that way, she advice. was a great she was a great tactician and strategist, um, cultural, <laughs> cultural and political, as well as um, you know, a wonderful artist. Yeah, and that just brings me to my other question about the theatricality and the conventions that you use in the book, because there's references to blackouts and entre acts and exits and entrances. And can you talk about how those conventions gave you a voice or gave you a structure in, in, in the- What they gave me was many, many voices. They, they gave me <laughs> the opportunity to impersonate, to masquerade, um, to not, pretend that I was smoothing over you know, disruptions and conflicts and tensions, in fact, to use them. Um, I think Peter earlier when we were talking used the word memento, which makes me very proud because I, I did want that sense of um, you know, this, this stage, this landscape, these screens where actions, internal and external, were always unfolding. Um, so those those devices um, allowed me to switch time, <laughs> switch focus, switch voice, switch character, um, and by keep you know that I was able most of the time. I mean, I could go into the book and say, "Oh no, I should have done this better," but not tonight. Um, the fact that I was able, you know, to um, to keep that keep those diverse parts um, you know, mobilizing into, um, into um, a spectacle. Uh, yeah, yeah, a journey, um, but a spectacle with lots of digressions along the way that still made their way back to the center. Mul multiple personalities, but not as a disorder. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Multiple personalities and, um, and narratives, yeah. Very Some well. of them tiny, but <laughs> but narratives, yeah. Well, very, very, very effective as punctuation. <laughs> Great, good. I have a, a a really favorite quote. It's it's um I think it's on page seven. Memoir is your present negotiation with versions of your past for the future you are willing to show up in. I, I just love that, and I'm 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 curious to know, is there anything in hindsight now that was revealed to you? What secrets does the time traveler possess? The time traveler possesses the, I don't know if it's a secret, but maybe it's a secret pathway through, back to your past, where without rejecting it, um, without falsifying it, you can realign its elements to um, allow you to, to consider, to reconsider um, your, the choices uh, that you made and to ponder what choices you might make in the future. Um, or yeah, it, what it, it allows for a kind of improvisatory, um, you know, the, a, a, mus a musician, you've got your technique, you've got all this information, which is your past, you know, and, and also your present. But every time you sit down at that piano or, you know, whether you're playing or whether you're using your voice, you can 
you can't, you're not necessarily going to rewrite the composition, but you're going to change the notes, the harmony, um, the melody, maybe the tempo, um, and all of that, um, that, those are the negotiations. So it allowed me to review, revise, revamp um, stories, um, experiences, memories that are often in our lives, certainly in mine, had become somewhat static. You know, I had one way of processing them, of arranging them, you know, um, so vary the scene, uh, <laughs> you know, place it somewhere else, have the dialogue written, you know, put it in someone else's mouth, see what happens. Well, in and, that's the future, and that's the future you're willing to show up in, <laughs> the next page, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of that, Margo, would you like to read a short section from the book and reveal some of your great writing to us? Well, you're very sweet. Do you have a, do, does either of you have a passage you wanted me to read? If not, I think I'll, okay, I'll- um, Your choice. I'll, all right, I'll actually read you how it, um, the opening, um, because it does kind of demonstrate what um, you were saying about the, the theatrics. Um, I stood in a bright, harsh light. The stage was bare. I extended my arm, no, flung, hurled it out, pointed an accusatory finger, then turned to an unseen audience and declared, this is the woman with only one childhood. It was part of the night's dream work and I was rattled when I woke up for I'd been addressing myself. My tone was harsh and my outstretched arm with its accusing finger had the force of that moment in melodrama where the villain, hitherto successful in his schemes to ruin the heroine's life, is revealed, condemned, and readied for punishment. I understood what I had to do. At the end of his stage shows, Bill Bojangles Robinson would look up at the lighting booth and shout, give me a light, my color. All men black out. When the light returned, I knew it was time to construct another nervous system. For most of my adult life, I'd felt that to become a person of complex and stirring character, a person, as I put it, of inner consequence, I must break myself into pieces, hammer, saw, chisel away at the unworthy parts and rebuild. It was laborious, like stone masonry. And on the same masonry model, the human self says, go on. Those are actually the last words of Negro land, go on. Admires itself for saying, go on, and proceeds to go on. As I went on, I grew dissatisfied. This edifice was too fixed. I wanted it to become an apparatus of mobile parts. Parts that fuse, burst, fracture, cluster, hurdle, and drift. I wanted to hear its continuous thrum, thrum, go the materials of my life, chosen, imposed, inherited, made up. I imagined it as a nervous system, but not the standard biological one. It was an assemblage. My nervous system is my structure of recombinant thoughts, memories, feelings, sensations, and words. Repeat after me. It's time to construct another nervous system. You write criticism, you write memoir. What will be your tactics, strategies, instruments for constructing this nervous system? I keep carping and fussing, rearing up against the word critic and criticism. Such august temperate words. They make me think Gertrude Stein was right that nouns are boring because all they do is name things. And, quote, just naming names is all right when you want to call a role, but is it good for anything else? So is quote. When you're thrilled by a, a taffeta petticoat, a flying buttress, a sound chamber of notes and syllables, when an idea makes you feel as if the top of your head were being taken off, then abandon your two temperate prose zones and keep writing criticism. As for memoir, I keep attaching adjectives to it. Cultural memoir. Temperamental memoir, what makes me so anxious? I want memoir and criticism to merge. Can they? And if so, how? Read on. 
Um, I think, yeah. Okay. Oh, merci, merci. <laughs> All right. We're going to now open up for questions uh, from the audience. So, um, yeah, before you do that, let me yeah. just thank you both. It is, I'm an East Coaster, but I know all about the West Coast and City Lights and Mechanics Institute. And you are legendary, and I am very happy to be here. So, thank you both. It's been a pleasure. And yeah. now we're going to open up to questions from the audience. Pam Troy, our events assistant, is going to read out your questions and we'll engage with you. All right. It's always a little, a little scary. Okay. <laughs> okay. The first question is from VTIL. I realize many authors were influential. Could you choose the top five? No. <laughs> I can't. You mean influential in my life or influential? No, I, I can't really. You know, well, I, I don't quite know what the question, what, what, in what context those top five should be. Okay. Um, I think, I think a lot will be revealed in the book. So Get yourself a book. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you will find that I have certain certain writers, um, often poets, um, but you know, essayists. There are I quote Emily Dickinson, I quote James Baldwin, I quote Du Bois and George Eliot, um, and at various points, um, I I quote F. Scott Fitzgerald um, at various points. Richard Wright too. Um, Linda, Linda, oh God, no, it's um, Harriet Jacobs. Her, her original um, pseudonym was, um, was, was Linda. Harriet Jacobs, um, I quote Kara Walker, who writes as well as draws. So it's, um, it's, it really is an assemblage of influences. Catherine. See, when you, the, the, this um, VTIL has, has clarified by saying, in reference to the question, he was asking about the top five literary influences. And I think you've you know, by citing them, you've basically you told Obviously, us. Willa Cather, because I spend a whole bunch of time. You know, it, it's who you're obsessed with. They're not the people. And I think that's what threw me off, that every day or every year are necessarily my favorites. But they they stay with me. They um, I taught I taught Cather. Um, I've read um, Baldwin and Fitzgerald and, you know, for years. Um, <laughs> I just recommended that President um, Biden should read Richard Wright's Black boy. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Well, um, the question I have, I do have a question as somebody who also loved Willa Cather, I would be interested in knowing what was it about Willa Cather that you found so compelling? Uh, that you well, loved? there are these, there are these, she's wise about many, many, many things. She is profoundly wise about the intricacies um, and the silences um, often between people that shape um, human relationships, that um, you know, shape a, a psyche that cannot reveal itself, you know, to anyone else in her narrative, but she understands them. There are also beautiful, expansive um, sentences that that move across the page. She creates. She really plunges into scenes and characters. But yeah, there is a kind of wisdom. To her, to the whole, to her best books, and there, there are pieces of wisdom in 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 uh, Song of the Lark, which I'm hard on in terms of um in terms of race, but there are other ways in which it's a wise book about about women making art. Yes. Well, I'm not seeing many questions. I do have some some comments. And one, um, Mr. Ogus, Edgar Ogus has said, as a member of the Lewis Carroll Society of North America, I was delighted to read about your sister's gift of Alice's Adventures oh. Underground in your charming New York Times interview last oh, Saturday. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Yes, that's, um, yeah. Um, I still could recite a whole bunch of those, <laughs> those poems. <laughs> but don't get me started. <laughs> But that, um, yeah, to be understood by someone you love um, as a reader or, or as a listener, it's, it's very moving, yeah. There's a question, Pam, about Michael Jackson and other, other 
Speaking of, yeah. Speaking of. Um, central, are there any other... A central influential figure, yeah. yeah. Are there any other uh, cultural figures that fascinate you as much as Michael Jackson that you might write about? You know, um, I, I don't have the desire to write, you know, another short book about a single figure. There are people who, in a way, does Prince fascinate me as much? Yes, but I don't want to, I don't want to go that route um, yet again. So, you know, that's, that's, that's not uppermost in my mind. All, most of the people I wrote about in this book um, are dead. So in terms of the cultural figures that fascinated me. So I'll have to see um, what, what, what the culture throws up and you know, what inside me suddenly gets gal galvanized. But right now, no. Do we have any other questions from the audience, Pam? We're looking, we're looking through the Q&A. Well, no, just uh, some comments. Um, one from Ferna. Hi, Margo. I was an intern at Newsweek during the summer of 1975 when you worked there. You met with our group of interns once in a while, and you made such an impact on me. I've kept up with your career all these years, and she's written a, a memoir, Leaving Little Havana. She's looking forward oh. to reading your book. All the best to you, Cecilia M. Fernandez. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Ah, all right. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, I, I have never forgotten you. I, I, I was only 21. And I, I don't know, you no, made such an impact. I, no, but those are impressionable years, but I thank you for that. My and gosh, you were you an intern me. at a major news magazine. So everything in you was like quivering and vibrating, right? Yes, but you stood out somehow from the entire group of people who were there. And I don't know, I, I just felt this connection to you. You don't remember me, I'm sure. But you came in, I think you were working there as um, an editor I was, a, I was, you know, I was a book reviewer, basically, or a book reviewer oh, okay. and arts writer. Yeah. But you also were at Columbia at that same time, I thought. I think, I think I, I was, I think I may have been adjuncting, teaching an adjunct. Oh, okay. An adjunct. Well, in I, journalism school, probably. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say hello. Thank you. Hello, hello. I have another former student here who should have produced a question by now, Rodney Ferris, a former college student. I did. The question about Michael Jackson was mine. <laughs> but the question about Michael Jackson was mine. Oh, so you're hoping that I'll find someone else to to write about? Give me some was, suggestions, Rodney. Right? I was totally curious as to whether or not you would, but I do have another question. Yeah, please. Which is, so uh, I was fortunate enough to be taught by Margot when I was an undergraduate at Princeton. And she co-taught this amazing class with Elizabeth Kendall, to whom she dedicated her latest book. One of my dedicates, yes, one of my best, best friends and a wonderful um, biographer and critic. Dan and I was wondering, uh, is there ever going to be a chance that the two of you are going to collaborate on something anytime yes, soon? Yes, actually, that is a plan. That's very funny that you divine that. Yeah, um, we're the same generation. Um, we are both women. We have these, you know, many, many differences. We grew up through certain historical movements and we want to write um, also about um, friendship as a major um, model for how one lives one's life. <laughs> so that is one of my plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Margo, from, from your teaching career, do you have a, a favorite book other than, you know, Willa Cather? that you really just had a passion about teaching. And can you tell us about that? Well, I will tell you, because um, I've taught so many of them, is, at, you know, I'm now at the, um, in the nonfiction program at Columbia. So when I came there, I was teaching, uh, of course, you know, criticism, um, but I got very interested. I think that was, I think I'd already, I came to Columbia full-time after I'd written the Michael Jackson. So I was very interested in the fact that the essay, um, varieties of the essay were really, really, really emerging um, in the 2000s. Um, you know, there was the political essay, the cultural essay, there was John Degada, you know, and this lyric essay, this experimental form that could borrow from short stories, from poetry. So I, I 
it was part of this whole move in um, what's now called creative nonfiction or literary nonfiction, you know, to for, for in which nonfiction writers felt that um, intellectually, imaginatively, they could experiment and, and combine forms and, and you know, ex probe points of views and structures, structural um, possibilities. That was that was that was thrilling to me. So um, I started teaching a wide range of essays, you know, from the kind of your <laughs> kind of classic 19th century to wild prose poetry. And um, I taught so many that I really couldn't entirely name, but um, I used all John Degada's um, anthologies. I used um, Philip Lopate's um, anthologies um, of the essay. I would, um, uh, then I moved also towards um, on memoir in, in surprising, surprising ways. So um, I would teach, for example, um, Jamaica, a Jamaica Kincaid novel, but make the students really think about, we'd really try to explore the relationships we do research on or between um, what was being fictionalized and what we knew of as autobiography. So just formally, you know, how, how you examine that. Um, God, um, I, <laughs> I tried everybody. Um, yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I think we have another question. Everybody, but I taught a lot of people. I would teach diaries. You know, I um, I would teach um, um I would teach um, documentary poetry. You know, be, and claim that it was a form of nonfiction, which in its way it is. Great. I think there's another question there. Yes, um, Abitel is is asking. Um, after reading right, I'm always depressed. How do you live with this literature for so long? Well, I don't read only right. I know exactly what you mean. I, I actually think um, that, you know, as, as we tend to um, our, our psyches and our bodies knowing, oh God, this muscle has really been stretched. I have to do something else. We do the same thing with, um, with our reading um, and with our music listening. You know when a writer has taken everything out of you. Um, and Richard Wright can really do that. Um, the, the ferocity um, and the rigor and the anguish. Um, so, you know, I will turn to something, I will turn to something wildly different. Um, I won't turn, for example, to Emily Dickinson because she is every bit as intense and can be just as painful. But, um, you know, I, I will just, I will pick up something utterly lighthearted. Maybe that's when you do go back and read a Jane Austen, um, you know, something like that, um, or nonsense poetry. You, you, we, we need to take care, take care of our, you know, our literary diets in those ways. Know how a writer affects you. It's as acute as how, you know, a, um, a tone um, um, affects your ear um, or a smell. Um, you know, affects, affects your olfactory system. Great. Uh, Peter, do you have any other questions on mine? Yeah, actually, you know, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, as of late, I think is getting much, much more play and also respect and appreciation yes. for being one of the greatest thinkers of a century. Exactly. And, you know, and I think, you know, th there's some incredible black scholarship coming out right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's a renaissance. It really is. And, and could you speak a and little bit about that? Acknowledged as such, you yeah. know, um, yeah. there is, yes. And um, there is this whole lineage, you know, of, of great and, and honorable and valorous um, black scholars whose work was for decades, um, segregated, meaning it was basically <laughs> read almost entirely by other Black scholars um, and students um, and whatever. Um, and now it really has entered the mainstream. Um, everybody acknowledges that, um, you know, you're not just doing um, your good citizen liberal duty by, you know, by reading W.E.B. Du Bois. You are reading him to learn in a profound way about the, 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 the key crises and, and complications um, 
and challenges um, and horrors of American history. Um, so, you know, some, I mean, that's, that's not, that's happening with literature, it's happening with history, but it's, it's, we're no longer um, a special interest. Um, uh, black history um, is no longer a kind of special interest, a kind of do good task um, and something you don't need to think about unless for whatever reason, you have to think very specifically about race relations in America. Um, no, this is about um, power relationships, um, you know, about um, psycho psychological um, crises and relationships. Um, it's it's major. I know it. There there isn't there isn't a global issue that isn't affected by what we lightly, in certain ways, still refer to as black or African American history. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I want to thank Margo Jefferson for such an inspiring conversation. I want to encourage everyone to stretch your muscles and re and revitalize your nervous system with her book, Constructing a Nervous System, a memoir. Um, thank you, Margo. You you are a literary diva. Oh, and we, are, we, we are so we are so thrilled to have you. And when you're when you get on a book tour live in person, please come and I'm visit coming. Us. Thank oh, you, us. Laura. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. I'll be there. And thank you all right. for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I can only see a few of your faces, but thank you. Yeah. Thanks to Peter Maravellas, City Lights Books and Publishing, for joining us tonight. And thank you. Uh, we, we will see you next time at our next event. And uh, everyone, be in good health. Yeah, be well. Stay well in body.